Hello everyone, today we talk about the Manipular Legion versus Macedonian Phalanx. And I already know that some of you say, oh wow, finally, this is the big thing. And others will say, oh no, he, you know, he fell in this uh, as well, you know, he, he should have avoided such a popular and overly discussed topic. But I, I probably, you know, con will content both in this sense, and I presume that you're actually the same people who believe the same thing at once. For, for all the you know, ancient warfare enthusiasts, this is probably one of the single most important uh, issues of 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 Hellenistic warfare, uh, of Roman warfare that, you know, were intertwined at this point. Roman warfare is, in a sense, uh, you know, frameable into Hellenistic warfare, but maybe that's a perspective we will analyze mostly for what concerns the, the Second Punic War in the the Carthaginians that were framed within that too, and that's a, a whole different topic, in part just because even today we'll talk about Pyrrhus and the alleged influence he, uh, his warfare had, and Macedonian warfare had, to, to be specific about it, because uh, on, on Roman warfare too. Um, lots of things to, to, to start off with as a, as a premise, because terms, concepts, um, are very, very important here. So um, this video, first of all, is meant to um, offer uh, historical judgment on the um, comparison between the, the various battles. There are just um, seven, basically, that involved the uh, Roman legion and the Macedonian phalanx, right? And, and therefore getting to the conclusion, what is the the deal here, right? Uh, what's the debate? Because um, there is naturally a lot of factionalism, if you want. Um, you know, who was the strongest, right? These are the, the questions that popularly are raised to determine factually which was the, the superior inferior system and all this stuff. There are a lot of people that even I've seen, they, they keep publishing stuff on, on, on this topic that it, for any uh, you know person that has any historiographical understanding knows that by by itself, it's completely exhausted, right? Unless you know a new document from ancient historiography comes out and describes in in detail one of these battles, which never happened, unfortunately, right? Uh, this is you know we we know what happened, right? Or better, we know what we we have and what we will remain with fundamentally, and that that there's not much further room for expanding this this topic. This is already something that will disconsent something because there is always the, you know, the ultra interested hyped person who says, you know, what what's the exoteric knowledge behind this thing, you know, it takes great military minds to understand. No, it just needs for you to to know the the original sources and to realize how few we know about these things and how humble we should be because fundamentally we have not an idea how even this systems actually fought. I don't think that will probably surprise people. Aha! We, I think we we knew how we f the, these systems. No, we don't. We don't, right? We have not the literally idea how these guys engage in combat. Uh, we we don't know the mechanics. We don't know the arrays. We don't know what what fundamentally happened. If not in a broader perspective, that is incidentally the one that at the end of the day in war makes more sense, right? To explain how things went. So this topic is often addressed, I suspect always, because there is this new generation which, to which I belong uh, as well, in the sense that it was raised with this, you know, uh, ancient war for video games, think about the total war, that sen sensitized uh, millions of young minds in, around this topic, which, which was, you know, the best tactics. They did the manipular one. The, the phalangitic one. Here, by the way, I will use either, you know, I could say Hellenistic phalanx, but technically there were multiple Hellenistic phalanxes because technically the Euclidic one was still there. The term phalanx itself is, you know, very flexible. Um, in, in same Greek, it, it's uh, the, the same uh, authors at the time use it indifferently to, to talk about any kind of you know, heavy infantry formation, like even the Celts for, for a Greek had a, a phalanx, right? Even though that has absolutely nothing to do with phalangitic warfare, the same goes for the Romans, same goes for the Carthaginians, right? Um, other important thing, you should be acquainted to, to ancient 
languages uh, such as Latin and, and, and Greek because otherwise, you know, if you can't even translate properly the terms from a semantic, or semantic point of view, there's a very few things to do with that. Also, if you think that um, ancient terms fit uh, post linean encyclopedical categories with a fixed meaning, also you're probably far from, from ancient history in general uh, because history is made on sources in the first place and such things must be known. And no, translations are not enough unless you know the uh, you know the original in the text and you can't confrontate with that but we have actual scholars who relied on translators and and got some horrifying things like you know translating long as pike uh, like Connolly did for which all the internet now is filled of pictures of Carthaginian infantry using you know the Macedonian phalanx which never existed historically by any stretch of the imagination um, these are all things we, i have actually um, explained here and there and today relatively to, to this topic of the manipular religion and the Macedonian phalanx we will actually start from 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 the the bottom in the sense that I should have first of all made uh, a, a, a battle video like I usually do um, for all these battles that we will reference to today uh, and I still haven't because our rhythm on ancient warfare is uh, I'd say is looser than I don't know the one on medieval history uh, so we haven't covered that yet but my point is that we will we will do it right uh, the point is that I already did that analysis on my own because I had the opportunity when I was doing my master thesis to uh, avoid um, you know uh, uh, a Roman history exam on very literary historiographical issues, but I'm sure it would have been interesting with, you know, I contracted and negotiated instead to write a thesis on this specific topic with my professor, also because I wanted in to to write a master thesis with him on this topic, and um, he said I didn't betray eventually my medieval history curriculum. Um, but this was one of my greatest satisfactions at university, because otherwise you have just to to do what other people tell you to do and i took the sources uh on, on all the sources on these battles there are not many right it's something you can write in you know some some tens of pages it's not a big deal i, I analyzed all these battles i drew a conclu i compared them of course and um, wrote a conclusion that today i will read in fact from my own thesis that i have here um in front of me and, and the, the problem is simpler uh, than than it seems, right? It, it's just that it's not easy, as most things in history and in military history. So today's deal is to come up with, with this conclusion, with this judgment, which, as you will see, is not uh, definitive. It's, it's mostly meant to, or better, it's definitive from an historical point of view as far as, as we said before, the, the issue has been exhausted, historiographically speaking. If somebody comes up with you and said, you know, historiography has, hasn't still analyzed the stuff, I know better, I know how they work, just that, that person is a charlatan, right? Because we have already exhausted it, and we know that we don't know, right? Um, and the, the issue, though, is, is naturally open to, to judgment in the sense that it's... Um, it's a topic that doesn't have quite a solution, but it shows you how fundamentally we can't be sure about which system fundamentally worked better or worse, um, at least on certain standards. I must confess that I came back on this text after some years for making this video, and the first impression I got is that I had somewhat... Um, you know, positive bias towards the Macedonian phalanx, which is... Actually, um, you know, I, I like, let's be honest, I, I like the Romans better, but, um, and I do believe, actually, that if, if for a definitive conclusion, yes, the manipular religion had probably an edge, but this edge was not decisive, right? In, given the, the situa all the various situations in war, and these battles are too few, and actually the outcome is also not particularly in favor of, 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 the, of the legion, so decisively. Right, the legions at this point. Some, some of these battles are draw. Right, as we will see, most of these battles weren't even pro properly 
um, won by either the phalanx or the the legion in itself. Because first of all, there were other units fighting alongside them, uh, allies, other you know, think about the elephants. Actually, from both sides at some point, at least in separated battles. Um, and um, and therefore, the conclusion you get to, as we will see now, is that fundamentally we we don't know properly. We we, we have a, a difficulty to understand which system fared better in general um, just from this information because it's it, it's too few episodes but at the same time this derives from another realization that is to say that these two systems were pretty damn effective each one on their own way and that's the differences broadly meant weren't huge right which is another concept that is difficult to acquaint people to I guess because uh, when it gets down to ancient warfare, uh, that mechanicis, mechanistic uh, tactical attention comes into place for saying, you know, which was the, the tactical formula that fared better. You know that in war, this is, uh, and we've seen it in the Von Krieger playlist, this is not exactly how things work. That is to say, first of all, we're talking about ancient, the ancient world, and these systems, doesn't matter how different they were, they were pretty similar. I mean, armies function pretty much in the same ways. The fact that you have pikemen from one side, you have, you know, uh, swordsmen from, from another, doesn't quite uh, make the difference that you expect. Uh, it's not really the point. Uh, it, it's not resolved mechanically by one versus one things. Uh, there was a there was a picture that circulated on the internet, and I googled today because I wanted to put a, a giant, you know, red cross on it to say wrong false on on the um, idea that the Romans kind of managed first of all on the idea that the Romans had it so easier against the phalanx and secondly that um, it was so easy because it just took to, to shift you know the pike aside and to go in through uh, the, the enemy formation and butcher them with a sword it didn't work like that the Romans never broke the phalanx frontally they did fight frontally against it they threw themselves into the pikes but they never broke it themselves um, the most uh, important battle that um, today we will look actually at Polybius' conclusion, famously enough, on the topic, which comes at 1828, which fundamentally speaks favorably of of the of the legion, saying you know they had the the upper hand fundamentally on the phalanx. Polybius is a beautiful source, and we will address now in 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 part to to understand first of all what he thought, but also what he was practically about. Polybius is um, an extraordinary source that, however, is credited with a military competence that objectively we had no historical proof he had. Uh, Polybius from Megalopolis, you, you know what we're talking about. I mean, he even, you know, historiographically we gave the name to, to the Roman legion at the time because of him, because he's the one that talked about it the most. So we, we called it the Polybian legion to define something very peculiar. Uh, because the Roman legion, even in, within the manipular uh, era, let's say, wasn't always the same thing. And this is something that is often overlooked also by modern reconstructions. I mean, the, the fact that um, standardization was, was still not there. There was an heterogeneity also in the composition of the arm. And this will be clear, especially we will, when we will analyze the, these battles individually. But even today, we, we can have a hint of that. Um, you know, his story. he was a military advisor, he was a cavalry commander, he was sent to Egypt to train the local uh, troops, but um, he was strategos in a pacific time, fundamentally. He never led a phalanx in battle, nor he ever saw one in action. And this is extremely important to understand. So his understanding of the phalanx and, and, the, le and the legion is less than what we believe, um, and this is very um, uh, easy to, to, to sense, even when you read it in translation, for not talking about in, in, in Greek, uh, that he didn't quite, he, as a Greek, he, he was trying to make theoretical sense very well. That's what he was very appreciated also in the 19th century during positivistic time, because he's trying to make a, a logical sense of something that, uh, however, not necessarily corresponded to reality, right? Um, the same Polybius doesn't realize that the legion was different in different times. 
um, there are some gaps in this hex. Um, certain passages are absent. Um, so the matters of discussions are wide. In this sense, in the stereographical interpretation, yes, there is a lot to say, but all, even in there we have exhausted. We did, this is an evidence. So macroscopic uh, in nature that, that naturally invalidates any positivistic take on, on this topic. For everybody who, who is acquainted just to to the Polybian work, but ancient warfare, and th this is pretty widely known. It's just in, in that field, academically. In popular culture, people do not even know what I'm talking about most of the time. So um, it's not a big deal, believe me. I, I, as you you understand, I'm, I'm not even an, an ancient, uh, an antiquist, let's say. So, but I studied these things because I had a great passion. At the beginning, was driven by those same, you know, ideas. You know, which what, what's the problem? How can we sort this out? Maybe I can come up with a better understanding. This is our understanding. And it's this limitation that makes you mature and, you know, reliable in these topics. Not guessing, speculating about things that we renownedly do not know. And that by not knowing you, you just prove that you haven't studied. Uh, so, in, of Polybius, however, we have to surely uh, point out the in, in, incredibly modern, up to immortality, Right, as general setting of his analysis, which is extraordinary. Uh, naturally, there would be a lot to say about the other sources we get uh, information from uh, from about the single battles. But today we can't do that. We will do it in the battle videos that we will make at some point. That is also very important because sources sometimes are very distant in time. They had their own very subjective, let's say, let's call it, you know, as a, as a complement, understanding of such uh, topics. Um, and they, you know, they're so, so reliable. Na naturally, Polybius was, we can't say contemporary, of course, he uh, he wasn't contemporary of the Battle of Heraclea, but uh, he, uh, in his lifetime, he witnessed the definitive conquest of Greece by the Romans so much that he, uh, as a slave who was brought to Rome and was writing for the Scipiones that also were, you know, somebody who definitely knew how to command legions, but not necessarily he so dramatically uh, much um, as far as these major pitch battles in the employment of the facts, as, as we've seen, he, he participated to other important campaigns as well, but um, he you know, w it's that's very very different as an observer to to actually understand the whole deal, um, and this is just if you know, you know the clause of its in theory, uh, a major problem um, in general in the historical reconstruction. Um, I will address often. So as w as I was saying in the beginning, then I dig digressed. I, I will not say Hellenistic phalanx because it's misleading. There were other phalanxes, right? Which is in the same Hellenistic world. Um, I will use Macedonian because objectively that's how the, the Pizzitaroi, the, the pike men that made the phalanx properly meant, were called in honor of the Alexandrine legacy as Macedonians. Right? You said the Macedonians, you immediately knew that you're talking about the pike men of that arm. Right? So um, and that tells you naturally also about the, the enormity of of the the you know the the legacy the the military tradition and quality of the system that speaks by uh, for, for itself uh other other advice i'll say here uh i will talk about the roman legion and how i have already done it in some videos um for what concerns a lot of stereotypes and misunderstandings we have about the romans in general Right, and they are mostly of technologistic nature, and that fail to to understand even the the basic collective dynamics of men uh, on the battlefield and things like I don't know, um, you know, it's weapons that make the difference in warfare. You know, th those are literally the, the things that make the least difference in, in all history of warfare, um, or and or the fact that I don't know the Romans were trying to copy in the fact they were coming from a fr from a phalanx themselves. That that's wrong, 
right? I've explained this extensively in Roman warfare videos. Uh, Yes, I'm talking specifically of these so-called, you know, that the Romans adopted duplicitic phalanx at that point. That's completely false. Like, all updated historiography has completely debunked this theory. That never happened. The fact that you have a thickly packed formation of heavy infantry, like basically any other people around, has zero to do with adoption of oplitic tactics. Even the democratic system have basically nothing to do with how you fight as an, an oplitic system. The Romans, the, that, that hadn't even been born in Greece while the Romans were adopting that. Um, and even on the timeline here, I can't digress, but it's, I, I made it, I don't remember, I think it's um, Archaic Roman Warfare, if you're interested, that's the video. I, I, I explained these things. The fact that certain fighters fight with, for example, an oplitic panoply has absolutely zero to do with the fact of fighting in, in oplitic tactics. That's another thing we should also print in our minds pretty sculpting our skulls very clearly right you know you can fight as an individualistic warrior even if you have an oplitic panoply right uh, the the Romans weren't developing their armies because of coping with any specific military system the Romans uh, created their manipular system while fighting mostly in the northern frontier right, against the Gauls Chiefly, and even in there, no, the the, the Gauls didn't school the Romans, military speaking. The Romans basically were changing as a political and social system that fixed the intrinsic limits that the previous military systems had on the Rome. And the Romans didn't evolve their army to cope with any specific tactics, including the Greek one. Right, so never think that armies historically developed because somebody says, okay. Uh, now, we, of all the problems that we have in organizing a military system coming from politics, from society, as the Clausewitz and Trinity teaches and so on, we have just now to, to fix the, the mechanics of tactics on the field because that's essentially where all the problem gets down to. No, that's, that comes from having played too many video games when you were a teenager and has nothing to do with military history but any stretch of the imagination. Um, the Romans coped with, with they actually and has also the, the Battle of Heraclea shows pretty well because if you read the source of that battle you're you're impacted heavily by how advanced the Romans already were on their own by the time they met first the Macedonian phalanx and how Pyrrhus was impressed uh, by this and um, that all already tells you how something that you should know already by knowing military history at large that is um, military systems that are you know, two different from each other, let's say that, or let's say where the odds are too unbalanced, it, armies usually do not do not fought. They are not properly even armies, let's say, if you want to confrontate with. Um, the Romans were on the lead there. We were on the, on the you know, had the initiative, at, attacked the, the Macedonian phalanx. Uh, they were confident and they were defeated. Then, during the same campaign, they were defeated again and then they managed to, to, to win a, a victory, but eventum with also, you know, the help of means that they are seemingly have nothing to do either with the superiority of the manipular religion or the inferiority of the Macedonian phalanx. We will see these things slightly um, now, but uh, you have to understand here, we, we have to be extremely objective and serious about anything we say, because... This is literally, you can't fact check these things because we have just like three or four sources that talk about that and that's it, right? And each and everybody says just one thing that you have to, you know, uh, combine with the others and that's it. There is no other object of analysis of inquiry. You can maybe study the campaign, it's also very important, but at the end of the day what happens on the field, given the amount of information we have, is we have to go with that. Historically speaking, you you first of all you can legitimately doubt it's it's even a reliable information, but hey, it's still what we have, so we have to try to make sense. And I must say, of it, and that overall, these battle accounts, if you reconstruct them, you know, with, with military law, do, do make sense altogether, right? They show a pattern, even of a certain capability of the Roman legion, a certain capability of the phalanx, that in very different contexts as every battle was you know interacted in a similar way and outlined fundamentally the characteristics of these armies another very important thing to realize in here is that um, I once again 
stress it. I I'm, I don't think I'm biased, if not you know by uh, what I presume it's an objective historical opinion, not making you know being a fan of this or this other system, that the manipulator religion had a slighter edge. I can't even say an advantage because it doesn't make sense. That depends on the battle. Um, but there, there was something there that even aside from when I say manipulator, I refer to naturally how eventually you, you would imagine that mechanic on the battle worked. But here we're talking even of, of deeper things of how, I don't know, the chain of command, the broader, most virtue of the army, as von Clausewitz says, the command. And we'll see that those are the most important things at the end of the day, not how the legion worked in the field. We know basically nothing of how legions worked in the field. Um, it's... Um, uh, and not even about the, the phalanx, right? The, the few things, we, all we know about the phalanx fundamentally probably lined up uh, a very long distance from wherever they had to advance, and then they advanced straight towards the end, and that's it, right? We would need, like, at least 10, 24 volunteers in several, you know, months of time to at least solve some doubt and to verify the, the real tactical capabilities of a phalanx because otherwise we have zero idea of how they worked. We have no idea how the pikemen uh, f- fought on the field. And everybody who, who claims to know is a liar. And you can reference this, uh, you know, f- from to me, um, because they have th- there is no historical evidence of any type. And every person who has a, who is at least acquainted to this topic perfectly knows that that's where you, we st- we all start from. And the rest is just like mocking not our intelligence but the intelligence of who says such amenities let's say um, about the Roman legion there is more to say because we came to have an interesting amount of information now the problem even here is that the Roman legion changed over time the manipular tactics I s- believe me I, I would like to to tell way more uh, even in this video but I can't because we have to get to the point the video will b- probably uh, excruciatingly long, but um, the you know a, a 280 BC legion is not a 200 BC uh, nor a 150 BC legion, right? And there is not a, a linear evolution of this system. The Romans had been you know working this new manipulator system from like half of a century not more, uh, or at least they, they had fully functionalized it at the earliest, let's say, from that point, 30 years, as far as we can be, you know, reasonably at least sure on the base of the sources. We are still at the point that, I don't know, the Principes hadn't adopted the Pivum at the time, it still functioned with the spears. Um, so, but we have no idea, broadly speaking, of how even the, 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 the legionnaires fought in the field. We know that probably had a, a large amount of light infantry even on this difference is what is a light infantry or heavy infantry in this context. I don't have time to digress, but it's not, but, but because it's not important, otherwise I would explain it better. But it's a militia, if you want. It's, uh, the Romans fought mostly with Italic allies as well. And did fight, not in dramatically different ways, because the Romans uh, you know, were Italic themselves, and uh, there was a gradual homogenization of, of war for a long time, so much that by the Second Punic War, basically, sources say that there was no difference between the two. But uh, there was an important amount of cavalry. Uh, contrarily to what is usually said, the Romans had actually very good cavalry uh, for ancient time standards. They re- both in quality and in the, of, of the troops and uh, of the commanders. They proved it dramatically in the Second Punic War. They had even better commanders than the Carthaginians that had horses like, you know, that had good good cavalry, even the, the, the Numidian one. Uh, that says a lot of things. The same Pyrrhus actually facing the Romans in, you know, uh, at Heraclea said that basically they had the same level of, of cavalry quality as their own and and the epirotes came from the Macedonian tradition that basically had the the, the toughest cavalry in Europe right um, so this and, and also large numbers by the way especially fielded by the allies but the Romans also were fixated, fixed on, on cavalry much more than it's believed um, we have uh, here I won't even digress on the fact that we have completely to erase any modernistic kind of Reganian hopelessism uh, ideal of 
uh, of Roman and even uh, you know of Greek and even more of Roman warfare as if he, these were citizen soldiers framed in a republic this this were this was a basically a warlike reality they had emerged from a warrior bar- barbaric background from an, an incredibly short time right roman civilization is marked essentially by this right and it's also intrinsically different from from hellenic warfare that in here the macedonians had polluted a bit with bit a bit of barbarism themselves um but absolutely there is an individualistic ethos that will remain throughout all roman history in, in the legionnaire that contrary to what is commonly believed is not meant properly to fight in the thickly packed orderly formation better you know yes that's an heavy infantry that's the RA more like most, most lightweight that polybius actually is one of the few sources that gives uh, a space that is almost between legionnaires is almost a loose order and vegetus is the one that much later naturally it gives the same and, and it's like uh, so thick like a phalanx so those are the only two sources in all Roman history that tell us how the array of a, of a, uh, of a Roman legion was actually um, so soldier wise um, soldier to soldier wise let's say better um, so uh, the Roman legionnaire is individualist and disciplined at the same time its equipment speaks for itself these guys were dramatically individualistically minded the romans struggled with an enormous enormous effort to transform italic warriors into disciplined fighters but they actually maintained this individualistic mindset when the one-to-one was concerned roman legionnaire is essentially a warrior in mind still right it's it's just that it's been brutally and extremely violently and abusively disciplined like any civilization does with properly called soldiers and not warriors that are naturally inferior instead um, to work in formation, yes, but still with this dramatic individual capacity. And this is showed by the sources. Here we're talking about naturally a long time, 280 BC to 168 BC, uh, from Heraclea to Pitna, basically. So it's a long time. It's more than one century. Rome changed, um, and things happened in the meanwhile, including what we know during the Second Punic War, especially the Spanish camp, the Spanish and African campaign of Scipio, uh, where the Romans displayed. Uh, this happened on the Metaur- at the Battle of Metaurus River in Italy too, um, but uh, but by under the command of Nero, um, the the capacity of Roman maniples to fundamentally carry out flanking maneuvers in an orderly fashion. Now, this doesn't have to be taken as a standard even after that period. That is to say, how basically the Romans fought, I don't know, at Pitna, uh, on the Macedonian wars in general, uh, it's not doesn't show that, right? We, we have an incredible good, you know, this fortune of Polybius telling us about the, the Scipio's um, tactics, but... Every army was different. Every commander was different. The level of training is different. Um, therefore, and, and especially for before the Punic War, the manipulative religion as such, as a military system, hasn't gained that full maturity that will sh- uh, show afterwards. You know, here there is even the problem of the, the invention of the courts that allegedly has nothing, of course, to do with the Marian reform because it already existed. That's also another thing that people still believe and repeat. It's just pure historiographical uh, cliche and tradition. Marius didn't change anything from a military point of view. He just made a political reform that enabled the proletarians to enlist. The Roman army already functioned that way. He just formalized it. Um, and let's say with the court, with this flexibility, this greater, let's say, mobility and aggressivity and uh, autonomy of the various elements of the Roman army you know a court would ma- be made by three maniples at that point um, I mean as always basically uh, and it would be these larger bodies of troops that would be used to individually attack in larger masses but t- uh, to perform for example in the case of Scipio the surrounding maneuvers and so on what happened later is not clear at all Right, it's just a bit like for Hellenic warfare. We know much more, much better political warfare because it, it's better documented, and we know much less about the, the later, more modern Macedonian phalanx because those societies were completely different, were monarchical. There weren't middle classes that wrote about how they fought in, you know, like, uh, first hand uh, as citizens. No, th- those were, you know, 
the, the scum of society being enlisted to become professional soldiers and not giving a damn about that political or cultural role, right? Um, that's the reason why we actually know so few about the Macedonian phalanx in the first place. That for sure, however, was a hell of a military system. What I was saying, though, about the Roman legion is that before that time, so by the time of the, 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 mm, the Pyrrhic campaign, um, there is no evidence of any voluntary flanking maneuver. Right, they could find themselves on the, on the enemy flank for some reason, because they had maybe pushed themselves too far. They, they arrived. They could attack naturally because they were they had this individualistic hand-to-hand combat uh, capacity, which the the phalange normally doesn't have. Albeit, it's not true that we technically were defenseless. Right, they that that would be also interesting to 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 tell the time. But naturally, yes, there is an idea that when the phalanx is broken, it's vulnerable. The problem is that we have to measure how often that happened and especially why because it might have not been a, an intrinsic problem of the phalanx that otherwise might have worked maybe well right and this is the general picture that we get from here it might have been a command problem um, the lack of mm, you know an intermediate command chain as it happened at kynoscephali or tunocephali if you prefer um, or you know other reckless maneuvers and so on so that doesn't tell us most of the times that the phalanx actually had these dramatic difficulties on broken terrain. The, the most evident example is just Pitna. That is, in fact, also the one after which Polybius writes its account, saying, oh, look, the Romans were superior. But from previous accounts, there is not, no evidence of that. On the contrary, the phalanx you know, f- fared pretty well, even on difficult terrain. So that's another usual point that is in fact, made, saying, ah, but the phalanx break, but not so much, right? Um, other aspect here that we maybe have to point out is the fact, I've personally never been convinced of, of the relatively bloodless phalanx clashes. I mean, take a battle lo- like Rafi, and look at what happened frontally between the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic phalanxes. There were thousands of dead. So, probably, yes, the phalanx had fought in a kind of a ritualized way by a certain manner. That's also also a bit of a broader Hellenic legacy uh, at some level. But it's there it's produced by the, the, the same battle mechanics in, in a sense of that specific tactic um, and organization, say better. But the, uh, the idea is, yes, they probably fought with long interval, with, you know, long time intervals. They kind of um, cared naturally about maintaining their own cohesion, etc. But they weren't bloodless clashes, and th- they they would actually frontally deliver themselves a lot of casualties. And yet we don't know how they prob- properly carried it out. So for even the, the phalanx to maintain cohesion, or how what happened to the frontal ranks and so on. Other um, issue here is that maybe is unrelated because we won't be commenting on that as well, is the idea of the gaps in the battle lines. Now, um, there is all the, the issue of the Roman checkerboard formation, all this stuff, you know, how, how much distance were, was there from a maniple to another. All theories in here that, again, for anybody who knows ancient warfare, knows that historiographically speaking, there is no answer to by definition. Right, we we don't know. It's useless to say I ah, I think it was like that. So yes, it was like that. No, nobody knows. Nobody knows how the hell they fought. We don't know how the R- Roman legion fought. Okay, uh, the battle lines always had gaps. Guess why? Because there has always to be space between a unit and another. And like in any army in history, um, again, there's the smart genius that arrives and says, ah, so let's attack in the gap. To, to what advantage? Like because you can't, you think you can enter in the gap and then uh, obtain some advantage. How, right? Uh, so that you got, bas- you get basically between two fires and you you have to squeeze your own formation, create chaos. What, what, that's not an advantage. If you break an entire section of the enemy line, like one third, one half, yes, you can pour with, with the, the rest of the army is pro- that occupied the same battle line in front uh, of the section that is broken, as it's normal in history. Yeah, you you can't you know outflank the enemy. Tank my eyes. That's how battles were won. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the gaps existing between the units. So any kind of speculation about ba- battle mechanics and how the Romans managed to, to crush it, it it's, it's 
it has nothing to do with any historical evidence we have. These armies fought, as far as we understand, as any other arm. They clashed frontally until some part of the, the, the line collapsed, also mostly because of what was happening on the, uh, on the wings, and or because they didn't line up in, line up in time, and that's how it happened. There is no positivistic, but no kind of, of explanation in general to say, to prove in the first place that the Romans managed to break the Macedonian phalanx frontally. There is not even a single evidence of that. Not even one. They fought like any army front, uh, clashing frontally, right? And the only evidence we have in Pitna is that the, the phalanx broke itself on, on rough terrain and the Romans had enough commanding capability to, to send single maniples to attack in the gaps that had formed and that had, were large enough to attack the phalanx on, you know, on the exposed side. But not because there were gaps in the phalanx itself, because those already happened and nobody would throw themselves in them thinking to get an advantage from it. Because guess what? Uh, human armies function in intelligent ways so that humans do not kill each other because they, that there is not the genius that came up with, the, with the, the, the best formation, right? Warfare always functions that way and the only people who do not really reason intelligently are the ones that didn't notice this in, in the first place. Um, so let's, um, so as I was saying before, we will not talk about individual battles, uh, at least in their entire development. I will say something because I remember them, because I reread some aspects too. You have to be precise about these uh, things when you talk, so we will make some reference. But um, fundamentally now we'll start listing the, you know, the information that we can't get about this confrontation and fr from the individual battles and then saying what Polybius states so that we can be, I don't know whether to read him before uh, but anyhow, no, it's better later so um, the Battle of Ereclea right first of all, there is a, an interesting series of mm, acknowledgements from the Epirot side about the Roman effectiveness uh, Pyrrhus was impressed by the Roman order. Uh, he was impressed he was, he, by the speed. That he was surprised by the fact that the Romans crossed the Sirius River, that he had also sent a detachment in front of to, to prevent the crossing. He al already found them lined up. He actually attacked himself with cavalry, but then he was overwhelmed by the Romans and went back to, to the phalanx. And the main clash answered. Um... The um, this doesn't necessarily speak for a greater Roman maneuverability um, over the phalanx, right? Surely Pyrrhus was surprised. We don't know why, because maybe there is the idea that he thought the Romans were barbarians because they didn't fight like the Greeks or better the Macedonians, um, and that therefore maybe that that's the bias. But that there is no evidence that uh, you know he un uh, let's say he overestim he underestimated Roman mobility because of. Uh, phalanx, uh, you know, uh, disadvantage at that compared to the same legion. Um, but it's still meaningful and important to remember. Also, let's consider that in that battle, the Romans were at numerical advantage and were passing on the offensive themselves. So that actually speaks, as also the sources say, of a, of a great moral strength of the Romans at that point. That impress, and that is that in close of its in terms, you know what it means. It's the most important aspect. It doesn't matter that the Romans actually lost, but the fact that they went on with the war, sources stress this aspect, that the, the Romans didn't back down, they didn't give up, they didn't quit. They were always, um, at that point, the, the, the Romans had a, a, a terrific mentality. Basically, they, they weren't you know, wondering whether they would conquer the world or not. They, they are, had already realized they would conquer the world. I mean, they, they believed it blindly, fanatically. They wouldn't understand any kind of defeat at that point, right? Um, Oh yes, that's also where I was re remembering of the uh, coding forks now because of this last uh, statement. I wanted to say add to that any statement like you know the Romans developed the manipular system because they had to cope with the hilly ground of Samnium and Samnitic tactics is also not 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 a real thing. I mean, surely there was maybe maybe there there was something to it. I we don't deny that, 
um, uh, surely the Manipur religion for, was forming itself in those in those years, but uh, that that was a decisive advantage to be more flexible on that ground is is not technically true. I mean, you you don't find an army in the ancient world that is fundamentally more capable of fighting on a on a rougher terrain. Um, better or worse than others unless it's not an army meaning that you know you can have all these light medium infantries that go back and forth and make hit and run tactics like I don't know the Celtiberians the Illyrians all this stuff but one thing is having as the Greeks would say even for the Romans a phalanx right and so uh, uh, you know at that point they were all pretty similar right what we have here with the Romans actually introduced was this thing of the reserves that um does not appear of dramatic even in this battles actually does not appear as as drama even as an explicit factor of victory what is fascinating about this is 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 actually this that there is basically no um except for pitna where the maniples are stated like saying you know to be sent individually against the gaps that had opened up the phalanx um the um, there is no idea that there is no information like the Romans won because they had reserves because they could um, swap lines during the battle, right? That surely was a thing and was very important. But that also means that still it's the same number of men that have to cope with the phalanx. I mean, the phalanx didn't have that, but at the same time, there were still you know the, that that amount of men fighting at the same time. Yes, without uh, without relief, the Romans did. But if you consider the the general you know approximation to symmetry that these battles had in terms of numbers that is evidence in here as well um, nothing I mean it, that means the Romans had to make fight in theory less men at the same time there is no evidence of that swapping in these battles right even about that it's important to realize that albeit we, we do know that the manipular religion was based on that reserve principle um, uh, the, so that when one line would break, at least there were other fresh units behind that could sustain the fight and, you know, lengthen it more than else the time of the fight itself. Because that's how it happens in practice, but still thinning the, the amount of troops to fight at the same time. We have, first of all, no proof of how this swapping happened. And even in there, every person who tells you, you know, that's how it happened. It's the mutatio or mutatio, if you prefer. Uh, they, they, they did like that. There are, I will explain at some point what's probably the most probable way they made it but we, there is zero evidence of how they made it that is we don't know and these battle accounts do not talk about that so whatever it was even in there those are things that might have hap actually happened also in other armies in different ways but still the concept of reserve ex did exist um, in this sense also the you know also the phalanx use similar systems uh, if you consider what the general reserve is that is you know, maybe you arrange certain troops in back or especially the skirmishers the other troops like the medium lighter infantry or the same cavalry right that is very it's these are both combined armed systems same romans had them because guess what the army is not made entirely by either legionnaires or the phalangites and that's also another thing you have to take into consideration because if you look at the numbers there you realize even at battles uh, like i don't know Scaphalites, you know, the Roman, uh, the, the Macedonian army is not uh, all phalanx. Like almost a half is other type of infantry coming from allies from other troops. So uh, even there, the, the importance of the phalanx dilutes in those numbers. And the same goes for the Roman, for the Roman legions. For not talking about the fact that uh, sometimes it was exactly the allies that that made a difference, and sometimes not an irrelevant one. Look at Magnesia, uh, the Pergamene uh, cavalrymen against the, the Seleucid uh, chariots that basically made collapse the wall of the Seleucid right wing. I mean, those are important things. You can't say, well, it was the Legion. No, it wasn't. It was just another part of the army that wasn't even Roman. The same goes for the, for the I don't know, the Epirus, the Macedonians, the Seleucids, right? Look at the Italic allies that Pyrrhus had. Uh, or... Uh, you know, the others, but the, all the Balkan uh, mountaineers, skirmish, slash skirmishers that the the, the Antigonids usually uh, usually employed. Um, so, um, another uh, remark of Pyrrhus, famously enough, is also at Asculum 
that you know ah, if we win another battle against the Romans like this, we are done for because of the huge losses that the Phalanx suffered. So even that is important because it speaks for the periodic uh, Italian campaign of a Roman army that 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 d beats quite hard. Right? It doesn't matter whether you know most engagements it was defeated, especially the the ones that were more in open field. Right? Um, so it's you know. Epirus versus Rome is actually won by Epirus mostly from a tactical point of view, then eventually politically, strategically, they, the Epirus lost, and that's also what makes a war, and that's also what makes the armies that fight the, those wars. Uh, but we're not talking about that, we're talking about tactics today. Um, so, mm, coming back to the Battle of Heraclea, too, there is this remark, as we said before, that... Uh, the Roman caval Ro Romano Italic cavalry was as good as the Epirote then Macedonian one. You know, the Epirus Macedonia had, as we were saying before, a dramatic equestrian capacity of heavy cavalry specifically. Um in the Battle of Heraclea, from the story how the battle went, uh, especially among the infantries, uh, there is no evidence that helps to understand what the phalanx mm, cohesion had suffered structurally comp comp uh, comprehensively, right? Uh, nor to state that the legion at the time had less capacity and experience to exploit eventual gaps in the phalanx line right uh, we cannot rule the latter aspect out because it's obvious that as we were saying before they kept they went on they kept on fighting and one part of the line collapsed at that point you do exploit that that gap in the line but we, we don't what, what I mean here is that we don't have any evidence of the Romans having a, it's a draw fundamentally because they didn't win because of that right or you know i mean the outcome wasn't decided by by that um it was mostly played on on, on the flanks also eventually with the elephants and so on so with things that ha that do not tell us anything about any decisive edge or one or side or the other infantry wise to say okay it's the legions i also the phalanx. it's not like that uh, in fact the epirote victory at Heraclea was due as we were saying before, to the elephant charge that was eventually collected by the Thessalian cavalry that was also one of the finest uh, at the time. Um, mm, so we will not talk much about the, fa uh, the, uh, the elephants because those are, you know, it's evident how they were used. They were pretty, you know, difficult to use, especially as at Beneventum, uh, the Epirotes learned... Uh, and um, they, but, it, it, I mean, it's obvious, they had to punch through the enemy lines. And they were, I mean, the Romans had never seen those animals before in battle, so they were impressed. But uh, even in there, the, the, the difference of the elephants is, is not to be uh, underestimated, because everybody says, you know, armchair generals say, ah, you know, because elephants are too difficult to use, so never use it. Well... You know, they were used always by these guys, by the same Romans who adopted. If they used, if they adopt them, evidently they functioned in a way. And yes, I give you that eventually they, they were abandoned and so on. But it's still, whatever you see on the battlefield is because, it, generally speaking, it works. And people are not stupid. Uh, especially the ones that go at war with each other. And, it, you know, it's rather you who doesn't want to, to, to realize that and pretends that everybody's a general without even, you know, having been a soldier. And that's that's one of the great problems of our times when we talk about these things. Um, so the Battle of Ausculum, of Ausculum in, uh, uh, in, always in the Pyrrhic uh, War, uh, offers more food for thought, let's say. Uh, there is an interesting passage from Polybius that speaks of the alternation of the Semaya and Speirai of, um, in, of infantry from the side of, of Pyrrhus. Um, Semai and Speirai are two Greek terms that we could equate with the due caution to cohorts and maniples, 
right? In this, uh, um, Semaya stands literally for units that are under same banner, which gives you in, in the the idea of the cohort as, for example, was you know used by Scipio that is multiple maniples under same banner, right? So you group previous units into a larger one in a sense. And, and in Greek, that's uh, naturally in Latin there is a different etymology, but in Greek th that we comment in this Polybius passage means that spade I would go for the normal battle units, the, the company type. let's say the maniple would be uh, you know it varied over time in terms of size, at this point it was like the Polybian legion is usually 120 yes the centuries had fallen to 60 so it was double that um, but it's the, the equivalent of a company fundamentally that the, the mainly act um, you know the, the, the most tactically active unit on, on, on the front on, on the battle line right um, so what Pyrrhus actually means here is like what bit the you see the Romans themselves when you uh, in other sort of this is mostly Levi that that is later of course it, it speaks of the cohorts the cohortes in Latin of the italics by saying essentially that they had while the Romans had their own type of manipular system the, the italics fought in cohortes so certain people believe wrongly that this means that the italics brought the cohort eventually to the Roman army that means nothing because the the, the Latin etymology is quite different from the Greek one of semi is, is, is still similar it's still the idea these were larger bodies that however function like that because the italic societies were still, you know, a um, bit different from the Roman one. Uh, so they they would have their own kind of military organization was kind of less functionalized in the small unit taxes. So they would fi fight in larger bodies. This is the lar the broader interpretation. But we're not sure even about that. Surely they had larger bodies, even of and especially of cavalry. Uh, but the point there is that there is an alternation. Um, um that um Pyr that uh, that yeah that Pyrrhus would create in in his battle line according to Polybius between this semi and spay right because he had both phalanx phalanges specifically uh and allies at Ausculum the uh the Epirotes had already suffered great losses against the Romans before so um they had many allies up to we don't know the numbers exactly but we think they could even be uh, even up to a half of the wall formation so what does this mean it means that half of the epiroad infantry was actually made up of uh, phalanges the other half of i don't know tarantines italics um Celt, et, et, et cetera. Uh, what does this mean well it means that the phalanx was just half of the battle line Right, and this passage would seem to suggest, and we, because the Battle of Asculum, by the way, was fought in two different days, uh, so Polybius doesn't say in which of these two days they fought, but in one of the days, as other source says, um, the uh, the Epirotes fought the Romans uh, along um, a river and a rough terrain. So it's been hypothesized that this alternation of Spairai and Semaya could correspond to the alternation of units of phalanges and uh, and allies of different uh, order, let's say, um, along the uh, the battle line to render the Epirote infantry, the, same, the, the battle line, more flexible on the rough terrain. There is no proof this is the best historiography has come up with, but it's literally so simple, right? Um, from another source that is actually, let's say it, it's Dionysius from Alicarnaxus that is later from this, um, such alternation seems doubtful because Polybius naturally is, is more reliable, but uh, Dionysius of Alicarnaxus says basically that um, there were, if I'm not wrong, three different... Um, uh, the, there were multiple units, let's say, that the phalanges fought all from one side, right? Chiefly the, the, the right wing, in, among which there were maybe also the Tarantines. Now, I don't remember, it's not important. But basically, he lists what would seem even more military logical in, 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 a, in a sense. You know, that part of the line made up entirely of 
at least a continuous line of phalanges, right? That would have not been needed to be fragmented, like in in this interspersed among other units, because at the end of the day, the effectiveness of the phalanx was this pike uh, block that you couldn't break into frontally. So by splitting it into various units, alternating it with more flexible infantry, like the the italic ones and so on, um, you know what what's the point, right? If one of those sections breaks, it doesn't, and it's not to be found elsewhere. We know of the Romans that sometimes in uh, another of these battles, I don't remember which one, but it's not. Eventually, it doesn't bring any to any tactical conclusion. Intersperse Roman citizen infantry with with uh, with one of the allies. We don't know how it happened, but in my opinion, it sounds more like Dionysus says that he's, uh, you know, they were interspersed because they they constituted a battle line, but one, you know, the phalanx was still in one block, and yes, they fought alongside in the center and left, let's say, with with the rest of those troops, but it wasn't fragmented all along the line, right? Uh, I've heard some commentators that said, well, huh, this, you know, maneuver didn't help him much because at the end of the day, the battle was was a fiasco, but not really. Re yes, they did suffer many losses, but we know that in, in both days, the phalanx actually routed uh, the Romans, uh, at least some units. First day, the Latins, uh, the other day, I don't remember but, uh, precisely now, it's not important. But what I mean is that there is no evidence, even in here, that the Phalanx actually suffered of that rough terrain. The Battle of Asculum was, was terrible, right? They fought on an incredible play. They went back and forth in certain areas uh, between hills, forests. It, it was a, a bloodbath, right? And as far as we know, there is nothing that went wrong for the phalanx. That, on the contrary, always stood as this monolithic, insurpassable in, 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 in block that uh, managed even to rout who had in, in its front, right? Um, so this alternation, in my opinion, has never convinced me of any tactical, you know, deep tactical sophistication. I don't know what Polybius specifically meant there, but it could be so simple as simply, yes, you know, they, they all, like Dionysius says, you know, all the various national contingents, as it mostly happens in all these battles, right? They, the Macedonians all in one side, the, I don't know, the, the Samnites all in another, the, the Tarentines uh, elsewhere. So, in all battles, it, 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 it worked like that, right? We don't have evidence of smaller units interspersed uh, at a company level. No, there were all the various contingents that obviously fought together because also they had their own esprit de corps, their, their cohesion. They functioned well on a line that you you know, simply don't want to overcomplicate. There is a principle of simplicity and of mass in warfare where, of course, you, you constitute the battle line with what you have, which at that point wasn't surely the, the entire numbers of the phalanx that had been uh, decreased over during during the war. Uh, over time, but with all the allies that you had, there were infantry that, that would fight like in front line, like other units. They were also similar to the Romans because they, they were Italic spinning, and, and that that's pretty much it, right? So, in my humble opinion, and I don't say it's true because, again, we don't know that, but that's in my opinion the simplest explanation, and no other, you know, uh, tactic because there is also a, an idea that. Um, that is, here we didn't discuss at some point, we, we, we can't do it, is how much did the successor states improve Alexander tactics? And there is all this idea that any uh, minimal change, as hinted uh, from by the sources, like this one stated by Polybius, is the idea of a great tactical uh, you know, change, a reformation of the phalanx in that specific state no, there is no evidence of that. It is true that by the very end of, of the of the phalanx period, when the Romans eventually defeated it completely, the, the, the states were overrun, um, there was some implementation, there was some development, there was the integration of other units, and in my opinion, yes, armies like the Antigonid one, the Seleucid one, were pretty damn good, right? And they were increasing their capacities. They were, they were developing also towards different directions to, uh, to to be honest uh, the Ptolemaic one tended for example also to, to dilute 
uh, over time to, to even disappear to, to go more like the, the median infantry type usually said the Roman by Roman imitation but also even in there in the Hellenic tradition there were similar experiments to that and we don't have to be dogmatic about the fact that these mm, militaries would always use the phalanx no matter what because they were just a bunch of traditionalist Greeks fixated with Alexander it wasn't like that Right. Also consider that the sources are a bit biased in favor of the Romans, not because they are glorifying them particularly, but because objectively they, just as Polybius, that was one of the same defeated, right, uh, had to make sense of that defeat. That for the Greeks, yes, was a big deal because they thought they had invented the perfect system and nobody could, could ever defeat. So they had to say it was because of that specific uh, factor. Uh, that mechanically brought to the legion to be superior, but in practice it doesn't seem to be the case at all. It simply seems that the Romans were better drilled, better, ex you know, better trained, more experienced. Yes, they probably had. They, they, of course, the differences were important, but the way that the reasons why those battles were won or lost very often were something that do not hint at a mecha mechanistic cause, but rather the fact that the army was in intrinsically more virtuous and capable on its own, more better, you know, more mm, better functional, right? More functional and independently on the tactics that it used, right? And that's what we will talk about a bit for the conclusion, but this perspective is very important. Also, I don't know if you look at the Seleucids at Bagnesia. I personally love the Seleucids, and you have in that account also by Levy, etc., the idea that the Seleucids were this eastern horde, right, where it has such a huge army with 55, 65,000 soldiers. Of course, they didn't have that. So they always pass for the, you know, the, the eastern weird stuff that the Romans defeated because they were cooler in a sense, right? And that also must be understood in a world that was biased by definition, because at the time, it, the concept of objectivity in sources didn't exist because it wasn't needed historically, right? So um, I also personally don't understand those people who complain or lament or mock ancient sources because they were biased. Uh, you know, you're stupid for doing that. You, don't you know what the, the ancient world was about? What do you think? Did they have to please you 2,000 years later uh, for that you don't even understand what that word was, was, was about, right? Stay humble and learn how to respect history because surely uh, you are less important than it, right? Um, another thing that um, that strikes you in, in this sense is um, the it was normal for the phalanx to integrate other types of troops, right? At Asculum, there were the Tarentines, as we've seen. There were other troops. There might have been a Neolithic phalanx, as far as we know. We don't know of Taras having a Macedonian phalanx. Let's also erase from our mind the idea that uh, ever since the Macedonian phalanx appeared, other Greek states had it magically. No, some didn't have. Some never had. Right, um, and um, it costs a lot. It comes from a completely different political and social background. We'll talk about it in the end. And still, once again, there is not the magical tactical formula that allows you to win. You can win even if you don't use the phalanx, right? Not just because you're a Roman, but because you, you're someone else, right? And that's important. Of course, the phalanx in that broader Hellenistic world represented the most advanced military system, no doubt. But because those who could afford them w were so powerful in the first place that others weren't, and that is also to be, to be understood. But it was uh, what, what I mean is normal for the phalanx, just as for the legion, to rely on other troops that are not framed under that type of military system. Mm -hmm. Always remember that the Romans, throughout all their history, always fought with. 50% plus one, at least, of of uh, of non-citizen troops. That is, most Rom I mean, all Roman armies have been composed from this time onwards uh, of more foreigners than Romans. Always. Also, for those who believe that, you know, at the end of the, of the, the late Roman Empire, the Romans got barbarized and everything went down. It, it had always been like that, right? You know, and that's not, of course, the problem. Um, and, um, it, you know, that's also another thing you don't usually hear around much as an acknowledgement. Um, 
in any case, we know that at Ascolon, the Phalanx fought well. There's no demerit to it, right? And I I if you isolate, let's say, what the Legionnaires did and what the Phalanges did at Ascolon, well, you see that the clash and tactics employed, the maneuvers, the results, were similar to the ones of Heraclea. And there is no reason to, to think otherwise. Then there is the Battle of Beneventum, that was an epirot de defeat, uh, but not because of of, of uh, Phalanx weakness. The troops led by Pyrrhus in March during the night towards the Roman camp um, were f caught disorderly by the Roman uh, disordered by the Romans, not because they were a Phalanx formation advancing on a on a difficult uh, ground that would disrupt it. the The ground was was bad. The the night visibility was scarce, so that explains already by itself the problem that the Romans managed to coat this column by surprise. It was not deployed for battle. There is no need to say, okay, it was disordered because it was a phalanx. Because if it had been a legionary army, it would have probably been the same. And also the route that eventually, um, because the, the Romans defeated this, um, that were encamped on this hill, defeated this uh, attempt, and then deployed uh, on, on the field. And the the Macedonians eventually, I mean, the Epirotes, the, the Phalanx, deployed, um, the, I mean, the bulk of it on the ground. They gave, uh, they, gave the, they, they started the pitch battles. Um, and even in there, the um, uh, things were going well for, for, for the Epirotes. Eventually, the elephants routed for some reason they went amok they ran amok and they ran over the same phalanx and this uh, threw it in confusion and uh, the Romans won so even this doesn't prove that phalanx had it worse because the ph actually the elephants were running against the Romans and, and making them flee in the same way so once again there is no evidence no, that the phalanx suffered more of this incident than the legion Right, they they just were unlucky in that reason for having used the the elephants in that way. Who knows? Maybe without the elephants, they would have lost to the Romans. At that point, we could have said, "You see, the 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 Romans made it anyway." We don't know because it didn't happen. At least the sources do not record that. So there is no way, even for the Battle of Beneventum, uh, to to say that the phalanx was better or worse than the legion. The Battle of Cunus Cephalae, where things start getting interesting. So this is the Roman invasion of Greece. Uh, the Romans, up to this point, had felt unconfident against the, the Macedonian phalanx. They, the, there was this idea at that point that the, uh, the formerly Alexandrine world was the cradle of this dramatic military capacity. So even the Romans, they always be believed in themselves when, you know they began to step outside of Italy for the first time, were a bit insecure, right? That there was all a problem within Roman politics that is very exemplified by, um, you know, the, the struggle between the pro Scipio and pro Maximus party during uh, the Second Punic War, that essentially the great landowners didn't want to come outside of Italy because if they had done it, they would have, uh, you know, the middle classes would have ha implemented more the... Uh, maritime trade, uh, all these activities that were against the Latifundium. So, and and there was this general and legitimate fear of the of fighting the, the phalanx in its own uh, homeland, right? Cunus Cephalae as a Roman victory is the moment in which the Romans say, "Okay, we we defeated them," and they they secured their confidence and from the top of their. Uh, moral material resources eventually went to 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 overwhelm you know the, the Mediterranean to conquer to defeat the the, the phalanx the, the system itself they weren't scared anymore they they weren't inhibited anymore or complexed anymore this is really important as a cultural a, a factor because you have to think that what Alexander had done and this military legacy he had cons you know left with the, with the phalanx was something the whole world was obsessed by. Like the entire the entire history of mankind at that point, even during the Middle Ages, I mean, people looked uh, up to Alexander as the, the greatest thing that had ever happened in the history of man mankind. And objectively, they they were even right. Right, the Romans were obsessed with Alexander themselves. Um, 
and yet they, they, they liked very much for ethical reasons the idea of improving on the not specific that tactical system but the idea that they had somewhat surpassed the Greeks also at other things like for example the voice that you know Pyrrhus allegedly told the Romans how to make camps and they would eventually perfect them to, to become the best camps in ancient history um, that's also an interesting topic I would like to discuss because it it informed dramatically our vision in a biased way, in a very subjective way of of Rome's, um, you know, of the causes of Rome greatness, right? With, we, that we often overlook, that we have to point out, you know, the word technologistic. Um, that's a biased legacy that the Romans took for, for the Greeks to prove they were better and that we still believe in. And yet, it, it wasn't anything like that. Like, the, the, the causes why Rome came to rule the world are the complete exact opposite of what is usually said that Rome copied things from everywhere. Rome was a unique system that nobody had ever seen. It worked with, with, a, with a balance in a, in a dynamic that was not present anywhere, right, if you wonder why they made it in the first place, uh, not copying others. And because any historian of technology or economy will, will tell you that who is able to take something from, from a culture, integrate in it in its own one to, to create an original synthesis that even surpasses it, that that people is already technologically more advanced than the other, right? So it's a completely pointless um, argument. Um, more of that, because the Romans didn't want the world because they had a, a certain type of soldier compared to another. They won because they had a political and social system that nobody else had. Um, so, the Battle of Cunus Cephali has to be visualized a little bit. So, what happened is that the the, the, the Antigonids and the Romans had been clashing over um, Scotus, if I'm not wrong, this this um, ridge uh, over you know close to Cunus Cephali, um, and they had been battling over this you know across this ridge, and they had lost track of themselves. Eventually, they they found themselves again during this battle. They began to fight on the top of this ridge. Uh, with lighter infantry that they both had in numbers. So what happened is that the Macedonians managed to push the Romans down hill with the uh, their right wing, actually. Uh, their left, the Macedonian right uh, left wing was was yet to arrive and de be deployed because they had they were passing essentially from from column to battle line at that point. Uh, Philip of Macedon, the king, uh, had also, by the way, shrank the front of his of uh, the, the you know his his part of the army that would make the, the right one to uh to allow uh to to give space to to the left to to form on its side but the left part had yet to arrive so basically the macedonians pushed the romans down the romans made intervene the uh, their own left against the macedonian right but they were losing right um, there were other skirmishes before that, that are important for other reasons because, for example, there the Romans were saved by the Aetolian cavalry, they were their allies, but this is now not important. Philip Philip V Macedon had been uh, advised not to give battle immediately with the right. Um, they told him, look, wait for the left to have lined up and then go down against the Romans along the hill. Instead, he, he went just with the right wing. Um, so, what happened, basically, um, is that the, the Roman right wing saw that the Macedonian left was arriving at the top of the hill, and they charged it with their infantry headed by elephants. The Macedonian left, as soon as they, 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 they weren't deployed for battle while they were arriving, so they were caught by surprise, and they, they didn't even resist, they fled. So basically, the Macedonians lost their wall left. At that point, a tribune on the Roman right wing that had achieved this fit looked at what was happening on the Roman left, was being pushed uh, down, pushed behind, being defeated by the Macedonian right, and ordered autonomously to attack on the on the left flank of the of the Macedonian right. It was now they, they had basically sort of, but they were on their own flank. So. At this point, the Macedonian right was, uh, you know, they they actually they couldn't fight because this is the problem of the phalanx that w without flank support, 
like any other army actually and let's be precise because of this uh, if had it happened to to a roman legion it would have been the same because all armies function like that but the, fal- the there is a point of phalanges as we were saying before were at uh wars um were at disadvantage when, uh, in close in hand to hand combat compared to legionnaires so objectively had a a, a a more complete um offensive capacity even their equipment and so on so they they were defeated. They actually surrendered by uh, rising up the the pikes altogether. The Roman commander mm, wanted to spare them, but the legionnaires went on slaughtering them anyway. Uh, Philip, in all this, basically had come up hill because he he didn't know that his left had been wiped out. So he realized that his whole army had was was gone, and he retreated. So. This battle is important because, as we were saying before, yes, it does show the vulnerability of the phalanx when attack on the flank. But what usually we don't realize there is that the it, every army functioned like that. I mean, look at Pharsalus. Any time an army was surrounded, uh, especially when you know w- when still committed, kept busy on on the front, uh, fighting on the front, it, it would be caught by two fires, would break and flee. Yes, the fact that the Phalangites even refused to fight, they uh, they rose the, the pikes and said, look, we surrender, may mean that they, they were more disadvantaged than a normal infantry because the deal of the Phalang was just to fight frontally and there was there would have been no match, right? No way to, to retreat. It would have been uh, more difficult for them to, to get out of there, right? But they were done for because normally that's when you're pursued and butchered down. So it, this is not even a proof of the inferiority of the phalanx. Um, and th- that's pretty much it. And what you see on this battlefield that was fought on basically on a ridge where the, the, the same Macedonians were crossing to give battle and pushing down the Romans actually shows you on a relatively difficult terrain that the phalanx didn't break. That the phalanx had the strength to push down the Romans to defeat them. Of course, they had the advantage of ground in that regard, but still, they the only thing you see there is that the left didn't arrive on the battle in time and line up in time, but it, that is fundamentally... Uh, okay, lining up a phalanx may be more difficult to line up a legion, but it's virtually you know, irrelevant, right? It's not pointed out by the source. Th- these are huge blocks of men that have to be deployed. It takes their time. I mean... Here we don't have the precise times and spaces calculated uh, millimetrically, but th- that would have been the problem of a legion as well, right? We don't know why the left was late. We just know that Philip hurried, that their advisor, his advisor told him, look, wait for the left to, to deploy it. They didn't, and that's how they screwed up the thing. And they were defeated because the Romans basically caught them from the flank, but, I, I mean, that could have been carried out Maybe if the situation had been reversed by another, you know, a type of infantry or cavalry that Macedonians had, because almost half of its army was not made of a phalanx. So even Cunus Cephali that says, ah, you know, here, look, the Romans destroyed the phalanx, actually it doesn't show much of an advantage, uh, a mechanical advantage of, of the manipular region that was pushed downhill and risked to be wiped out also previously. Uh, if it hadn't been of the intervention of the Italian cavalry, but for one aspect uh, that, in fact, excludes the same tactic mechanics. It's the fact that um, Polybius makes very clear that while the Romans had that anonymous tribune that had the authority, or at least the courage, whatever, to, to autonomously order the attack, the Macedonians didn't, right? The, the, the Polybius says it that the Macedonians didn't have on their left wing an officer provided with the necessary authority to give autonomously that order of um, deploying in order of battle, right? Which is a factor that naturally Polybius puts in parallel with. Look, instead the Romans had that, right? This is interesting because it also adds. Another detail that is not that the left, the Macedonian left wing necessarily didn't de- deploy for battle because necessarily they were late or something, but because they, they hadn't received an order, 
right? Which we, we, we can't know whether th this story is true. We can't know uh, whether, you know, what was the real problem there. But in an army where you don't have this functional chain of command in situations of crisis, is you, you can see a weakness that here has nothing to do with being a pikeman or a legionnaire. This has to do with the fact that probably the Macedonian army was less, you know, I don't know, disciplined, organized, trained than the Roman one. Possible. As it may be possible that this lack of an officer provided with the necessary authority to give the order deploying was random and that the Antigonid army was as well trained as the Roland one and it just screwed up because maybe that guy didn't have the courage to act or for, for whichever reason, it might have not even been tactical. And yet, that may be the indicator that the Romans were a bit more, you know, uh, functionalized as an army overall. Right, and not that they had any, the 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 maniple had an intrinsic advantage there in in anything, right? Um, it is true, definitely, that the Romans uh, were pro better uh, individual fighters than the phalanges, given the equipment, the training, and the, the purpose of, of those units in the first place. But once again, um, even in here, we have no clear proof because. The fact that the, the the Macedonian right wing was slaughtered was was normal, given that they were attacked from the front and from 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 the flank, which any other unit would have not withstood had it even been a Roman one, right? So even Cunus Cephali doesn't properly prove a Roman superiority, right? And it is to be taken into account. Consider these battles were fought mostly with equal numbers, so. Uh, you, you can see the odds were very balanced after all. Mm -hmm. So, the Macedonian defeat at Cunus Cephali is somewhat anomalous, right? That there is a, a, a mistake in command, Philip didn't wait for the whole army to deploy, and the lack of coordination at, of the two parts of the phalanx at the level of chain of command. And the scarce maneuverability or agility of the phalanx is not proven. Hell, they were fighting on a on a ridge. They were crossing a ridge with force with the thing. And this the phalanx managed to develop to cross it to push down the Romans. So, the alleged, uh, you know, flexibility of the Macedonian phalanx. What's, where is it, right? And we're talking about the phalanx proper, right? There were other, more agile infantries and cavalry that, that fought alongside it and that played an important role because the initial clash was started by them. But still, we have. The, the chunk of thousands of pikemen performing that feat, and it, there is no evidence of disorder. There's no evidence of uh, breaking the line, uh, uh, you know, in the battle line because of terrain. None of that. None of that. Then there are the battles with the Seleucids. The Battle of the Thermopylae. Here, the Seleucids and Theocritus III had invaded Greece with a small army. Uh, the Romans were a dramatic numerical advantage. Um, so that um, the Seleucids decided to give them battle at the gate uh, at the Thermopylae Pass to exploit the uh, terrain advantage, the Romans accepted battle and they attacked the phalanx in defensive position in the pass, which was pretty courageous to do in the first place. Um, the uh, the fight is fascinating because the Seleucids had deployed catapults to target the Romans coming out of from from the pass. They had created basically um, a ba um, you know uh, a, a, f a wall right from which they would target the Romans with projectiles. Well, the, the phalanx was fighting in the front, right, and in the front of the phalanx they had other light lighter troops. So according to the accounts, what the Romans do is that they frontally manage to, def to defeat the first line of light infantry, then they attack the Seleucid phalanx, and according to the various authors, either they defeated it and the phalanx retreated on the wall, from which with the Sarissai, with the pikes, uh, the Romans would, n uh, would be kept at bay and would not pass, either the phalanx didn't even break and the Romans were just fighting against it and the situation seemingly not, not changing. Uh, too much, right? We have to give dramatic credit to Roman infantry for arriving there, targeted by bolts of any kind, even of catapults and so on, and, and 
pushing against the phalanx in a fortification, right? There were numerical advantage, yes, but that was serious, right? So what happens is that the Seleucid had also sent uh, some lighter troops at three other passes. Uh, the Romans had decided to do what Xerxes had done uh, with the Spartans back in the day. So they, they sent this detachment um, it, to catch the, the Seleucids from, from, from the flank, from the throughout flank. So they defeated these lighter troops the Seleucids had sent to those passes, and they appeared um, on the flank of the phalanx. Now, the sources say specifically that the Romans that had outflanked the Seleucids were too few to actually present even a threat to them, but that the Seleucids freaked out because they didn't know how many the Romans would be, so they basically retreated. They broke and fled, and so the Romans won the battle. It's that easy, right? Yes, it's sometimes like that. So this battle is... Um, it's not like the others because it's not a pitch battle proper. Uh, the Romans were at great numerical advantage. Uh, but there is a psychological effect here to highlight that indeed um, shows, at least, um, we don't know for, for, for what reason, this is the point, that it would be enough to outflank the enemy to, to make it flee. So... People say, ah, look, this is because the phalanges were so weak when they were outflanked that that they, they wouldn't know how to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so they fled. It's possible. but And it, it, it may be true. Like, it, I personally, I also like to read the battle like that. But if you think about it, at the same time, given the numerical inferiority, and given the Romans could swarm in numbers, and the Seleucids didn't know, I mean, it even makes sense for for you to retreat. I mean, it might have been more prudent. Right, uh, then eventually maybe not because they were massacred, so it, it was a big deal. But you don't know why panics actually spread. If it was because the Seleucids would feel too weak in hand-to-hand -hand combat compared to legionnaires, or because they just feared the numbers, this is something we cannot assess properly. Right. Um, De another interesting detail is that when the Romans defeated the first line of light troopers in front of the Seleucid phalanx, the phalanx is said to have uh, opened uh, its array to let the fleeing, the retreating soldiers go back, and then it would close again. So that shows actually a great capacity of the phalanx to open ranks, to, to change order and to be able to still, you know, fight on, mm -hmm. which speaks also for a certain degree of, of, of flexibility, if you want. So the fact that these formations were were drilled, they, they knew how to work, right, collectively, they, they had a, a good uh, organization. Mm -hmm. This is the Tupermopile. Then there is the Battle of Magnesia, that is also fantastic it's one of my favorite battles at some point we'll have to make uh, a video on it because it's fantastic i made um you know in the seleucid warfare playlist i talked about this if i'm not wrong in, in the videos on seleucid cavalry because it was one of those few battles uh, an exception in the ancient world where a cavalry unit would route an entire uh, infantry formation f by charging it frontally. We're talking about the Seleucid cataphracts, uh, cataphracts against a Latin ala of the Romans. Levi tries to conceal a bit the thing. He says, you know, there was this kind of... Um, they didn't charge quite straight, but probably did happen like that. And th that shows the dramatic development that um, Antiochus III uh, had made uh, during his Anabasis in the East and developing this cataphract contingent doesn't mean that these were you know covered in armor from head to toe uh, cataphracts may in this context may may we explain in those videos may actually mean they were just armored normally but i mean the, the shock capability was so high to charge frontally infantry which was not done in the ancient world um with this uh they, they usually charge from the rear from the flank right um this is important because it shows how naturally uh, the Alexandrine tactics w were based on 
the hammer and anvil concept. So the the hammer would be cavalry, good strong cavalry, as we've seen at Heraclea as well for the Epirotes, um, and the the anvil being the phalanx that would hold this dramatic enemy impact from the front and keep it in busy while the cavalry would outflank. So this is a battle that doesn't actually show any clear um, you know, contrast between legionary infantry and uh, the, uh, the, the phalanges. First of all, the Seleucid army is said to have been huge, as we were saying before, to have been composed of peoples coming from everywhere, from Arabia to, to the Dahai, uh, some Pontic infantry, the, the Galatian. I mean, all what you can imagine the Seleucids could, could draw from, from their uh, client states. And um, they had on, on the right these uh, uh, Scythid um, chariots that were routed by the Roman left that was actually composed by the, Perga the allied Pergamene cavalry that skirmished the, uh, the, the chariots, the, 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 the horses began to run amok and the, the, the chariots invested the, uh, the other troops that made up actually the, the, the Seleucid right wing so the wall Seleucid right wing collapsed. Sources say that the, the, the Seleucid battle line was so long because the, there were so many people that from the center of the formation you couldn't see the, the, the extremes on the wings. Uh, so in the meanwhile on the Seleucid left you had the cataphracts breaking in through the, the, the Roman right and reaching as far as the Roman camp. Uh, so Basically, the Seleucid center that was composed by the phalanges uh, remained without protection on the right. And it, in order to avoid to be outflanked, there is this extraordinary maneuver they perform. Basically, they close themselves in square. The phalanx forms a square. And it, it encloses within itself, by the way, the elephants that they had brought with them. So... In the meanwhile, the Romans started to surround the Seleucid square, and the the Seleucids managed to resist. But the elephants in in in, in the midst began to get nervous, and they broke the formation from the within because the Romans were throwing javelins at them and all this stuff. So basically, it was a massacre. If I'm not wrong, that's where Roman cavalry kicked in and cut these guys down. Seleucid cavalry, uh, where also Antioch, uh, Antiochus III was, that had arrived to the Roman camp had been basically m met with resistance by Romans and Thracian auxiliaries and so on, and had heard news that the uh, the square was surrounded, had come back, and when he arrived to the center, he saw that everybody died, so they basically retreated. That's basically the battle. Um, so even in this clash, we have no proof whatsoever of uh, the phalanx being advantage, at advantage or disadvantage with Roman uh, legionary infantry. That doesn't even figure in, in combat as, you know, in, in a scene in some explicit detail, etc. On the contrary, we have this extraordinary maneuver forming a square, in a, and these were thousands and thousands of veterans um, of the Eastern Campaign of Antiochus III, that managed to form a square and to exist within it, right? And if it hadn't been for the elephants, we don't know. Maybe the Seleucid cavalry would have come back in time and caused some, maybe reversed the tides there. Um, so even in here, zero evidence to compare legionnaires and phalanges, right? There is not. Mm -hmm. Um, and it doesn't add anything to it. It doesn't, doesn't matter how important the battle is, etc. Basically here, the whole battle happens all for other units. The cataphracts, the, the seated uh, chariots, that's it, right? So you see, we arrived to Pitna, and up to this point we have no element to say, look, the phalanx, the phalanx sucked. There isn't. They, they fought well, right? Uh, they repelled legionnaires multiple times. They were 
uh, they, they, they were defeated eventually for, for factors that weren't related to uh, a disadvantage in the normal employment of their unit. It was either because of other units or because they of a command mistake. The Phalanx worked, even on difficult terrain. So getting to Pitna, the battle is very simple actually. Uh, the uh, ro th there is an interesting strategic background to this, but we skip that. We just know that Perseus, king of Macedon, uh, allegedly wasn't even on the battlefield, so you have <laughs> basically, uh, which may be a hint, m maybe things were going wrong, the, the, the fear of rebellion at home, well, this is, that's where strategic background is interesting, but, you know, this is the battle for Macedon that eventually was conquered after this defeat, um, and you have the king that doesn't even fight <laughs> not defeat. Um, but basically, the battle has started among the, uh, the the Italic and Thracian auxiliaries of the two armies that were taking, you know, they were drinking at the river that separated the two armies. So, the Macedonian phalanx there intervened um, in favor of their auxiliaries, and speed it up against the enemy. Now, what happens is that when the Romans arrive uh, with the wall army, they, they're surprised the Antigonians have advanced so much, and they start fighting, and the legion, uh, you know, the, the phalanx even repels certain units of Italic allies, uh, so it still fights well, but possibly because of the speed of their advance, and especially because of the rough, uh, rough terrain, uh, the, the phalanx basically um, began to split, right, uh, it broke, all by itself, right, we have no proof that the Romans did that, and at that point, the single maniple um, commanders uh, are uh, sent to, um, by their, you know, their, their commanders into these gaps, that were large enough to exploit that advantage, so they weren't the normal gaps of the phalanx, absolutely not, um, maybe the Romans used a conus formation, I mean, maybe they they didn't use their regular maniple formation, we don't know, actually, because we weren't there, we have no idea of how large these gaps were, what, you know, um, what was the deal, but surely, you know, there, there is the explicit information that the individual maniple commanders were sent autonomously to attack in those gaps, so the Roman command ordered them to do so. In less than one hour, the entire Macedonian army was annihilated. Uh, there is the heroic resistance of 3,000 elite uh, Macedonian troopers that were probably the the Agema or or something similar. That is also normal. Usually, there is always a last unit that gets self butchered um, to, to save the others, um, and that's it, right? The entire army of Macedonians is wiped out. Uh, Macedonia loses, and everything finishes like that. So, uh, what do we learn from this battle? We learn that probably, and this is the only battle that says it, that the phalanx had difficulty on a broken terrain. Why though? Um, they hurried up, apparently. They were without commander, um, without the king uh, supervising the situation. Um, by attacking the war, as we were explaining just in these days on the phone calls with Sirius, at disadvantage, meaning that the fact that they broke uh, the order of the formation accidentally, yes, it may be connected to the intrinsic phalanx structure and its possible disadvantages in that regard over the Roman legion, but even here we don't have a, a clear measure of it. Surely, though, we're given the the information that the Romans would be quite eager to, to charge them in, in these gaps that had been formed, so that it would have been useless to, you know, to attack them frontally as they, they would. Think that at the Battle of Asculum, the Romans are said to have thrown themselves uh, on the Macedonian pikes to, to defeat the Macedonians, the, the phalanges, uh, as soon as uh, I mean, before the elephants would arrive. That is an interesting hint, because it says that normally they would expect to defeat the, the phalanges frontally, right? But not by opening these gaps in a, you know, in a way that it's mechanically 
cutting into the formation, but just for, for wearing out the battle line and then to make it collapse somewhere as any battle line would, would mechanically work. So we should stop being obsessed with this idea of the Romans managing to cut through the phalanx to, by exploiting gaps. This is not part of these stories. This is not part of the historical evidence. It, it, nobody talks about that. At Pitna, we just have a phalanx that has already broken, and the Romans exploit this this important gaps it had evidently formed. But not because the phalanx would have that otherwise, the Romans would engage it, hoping to do it otherwise. There is no evidence of this, of any kind. Pitna is the only type, it's the only battle in which we get that a phalanx broke itself on different ter uh, difficult terrain, which uh, the the battles of Asculum, of Cunus Cephali, others were terrain was rough, do not say, and the, the phalanx would not do because it wasn't defeated, because it, it, it actually fought back pretty well, uh, even on that terrain. So even Pitna, that surely shows the autonomy also of the, the Roman maniples, this, this aggressive offensive capacity that surely the, the, the legionary units had, doesn't say quite, you know, distinctly that this model was, you know, was at an intrinsic disadvantage compared to the Roman legion. It just says that in that specific battle, this happened. And this is interesting because after this pass, uh, after a passage on Pydna, Polybius comments on the broader, because this was the last battle, by the way, between a Roman, uh, a Roman legion and a Macedonian phalanx. Yes, there is a um, there is a passage from the Battle of, of Caronea, if I'm not wrong, with Sulla against the Pontic phalanx, but uh, first of all, we don't even know what phalanx that was. It might have been simply hoplites or rather, you know, heavy um, heavy infantry, not necessarily the pikemen. That's why you have to stay uh, awake about uh, the actual meaning of words, and it doesn't count, let's be honest. Um, but um, Polybius comments fundamentally on the superiority on the legion after the disaster of Pitna. That naturally was close to him, it was contemporary news basically, uh, it was the, the biggest one, the most resolutive, because the same Macedon had been wiped out, in con so the same symbol of the phalanx, basically, where the phalanx had been created, at least the, the one of Pikeman, the Hellenistic, the Macedonian one, uh, was wiped out, right? And and the fact that surprises, indeed, is the, is the fact that the Romans defeated the phalanx in, le in one hour, right? So it wasn't even a battle, right? But the, the broader context tells you that maybe something wasn't working well in, in, in the army in general. I mean, the freaking king was elsewhere, <laughs> had f gone away, and wouldn't come back on the battlefield, even naturally when the battle was over. Um, so even that battle is not completely typical, right? Uh, the Romans might have had some concrete ground advantage. This is just hypothetical, but even in here it's not like the Battle of Heraclea where you see, you know, an actual pitch battle hardly fought between the two sides. No. It's something that obviously doesn't speak for these other um, phalanxes that had fought the Romans before, but just made a, a just a poor impression and bad performance in, in that specific case. So what does Polybius say specifically about um, the legion and the phalanx? So he supports the tactical superiority of the uh, of manipular legion on the Hellenistic phalanx. Uh, he describes the two military systems, he confronts uh, their principal features, characteristics, and he's, he, stress he stresses one point, which is objectively true, that frontally, the phalanx cannot be defeated. Uh, he literally says that. Why? Because it, he gives this mechanistic ex explanation. He says that because of how the you know the depth of the formation is composed, the um, in front of the first uh, of the first line there are f uh, for each man five pikes that are pushing in the front against the arriving enemy. Uh, he also speaks of the actual push exercised by the several posterior ranks. And he states also that every legionnaire occupies instead um, a double space in front in the front um, compared to a pikeman. Therefore he has to fight not just a 
against those five pikes at a time, but ten pikes at a time, because it's against two of those rows. Um, an obstacle that, according to Polybius, prevented him to even come to grips with the enemy, unless, you know, being killed, right? So, as we've seen, the Romans would fight like that anyway. Just there is no proof of any sort that they ever broke the phalanx frontally like that. That is, they would fight. There is, was no other way to fight it, let's be honest. And you go against an enemy that, uh, that, that, that is trying to kill you. In my opinion, Polybius might have been excessive in saying, you know, the phalanx is invincible because simply the legionnaire has these five pikes poking at him continuously. Because, yes, in maybe in practice this might have been true. I mean, the advantage might have been really the side. After all, what, why was the Macedonian phalanx so famous and used by everybody? Because it, it evenly functioned well, right? And it functioned well not because there was some genius that one day woke up, uh, Philip II said, you know what, I don't have nothing to do. I just invent now this system with ten pikes in front of every, you know, uh, well, he didn't know Roman legionnaires, but... Uh, you know, with that intrinsic advantage. It evolved. We'll have to talk about the genesis of the Macedonian phalanx, but essentially the, the, the value of it is the level of training of a, a truly professional army that in Greece had never happened properly before that because Macedonia had finally access to precious metals. Uh, it has these troops to, to, to put under, you know, um, severe... Um, monarchic discipline uh, that normally uh, democratic cities didn't have um, and that would train these troops to use the pike which requires a dramatic um, uh, level of training to use effectively especially at the collective level because pikes are useful when you have lots of pikemen on the field right so these must be intensively trained it's the same reason even if there are many differences that make the comparison incomparable, in fact, uh, with the Swiss during the mid-15th century. Why did they begin to use that? Because they were, you know, they, nobody had ever thought about that? No, because finally the, confedera uh, the Confederation had enough central power to impose discipline to these thousands of men to make them, to, to invest enough money to, to, to train them, which costed an astonishing lot. Right, and nobody had had that before. It's a matter of state building, and the same reason why Macedonia was essentially a feudal kingdom that could 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 afford that, and these city states normally couldn't, even though they would develop in part smaller ones as well. Um, but there were big, uh, eventually empires. I mean, look at the Seleucids, look at you know the the, the Ptolemies. They, they extended on, on multiple regions, Macedonia and Greece, large, and so they had the, also the demographic capacity to do it, which do not have to be discarded. Um, so that is what makes this thing work. It's not the concept in itself, but it's the fact that you can invest enough money to make the thing happen. Because otherwise it's obvious. Like you, you, you have all these pikemen poking in the front. They, 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 they present with a, a very difficult uh, impediment to, to surpass. They, they, they're going to fight back. They, they, they have a dramatic defensive, but also offensive capability. Because this phalanx is also aggressive, as we've seen. Um... So, Polybius basically says that, um, complexively, the legion couldn't uh, suffer the frontal onslaught of the phalanx if the phalanx maintained its solidity. Consider that Polybius was, was writing for the Scipiones. He was a client of the Romans now. So, he was actually saying now, as we'll see, these were the pros of the phalanx. And he says, while the Romans bit it uh, with the legion. Why? Because he says that the phalanx required flat uh, and obstacle-less, obstacle let's say, um, places to exercise its strength, right? We're not talking just about natural obstacles, but think even, you know, uh, it's not a, you know, a battlefield can have farms. Uh, sometimes they, they extend it over kilometers, so you, in, in real war you never have a complete flatland, yet we have seen as at Asculum at Cunoscephali that the phalanx went well on, on ter that kind of terrain, that difficult terrain as well. Um, and, and Polybius yet says that the scarce ma maneuverability of the phalanx does not allow it to adapt to unexpected tactical and strategical eventualities You can't put it at grave, in grave danger. Um, so here the connection is not so explicit, right? Of course he says, you know, it's a matter of terrain. 
But we know that war is not a non-deterministic system. We know that if you know, the disadvantage of terrain was so evident, uh, they would have fixed in some way. Somebody would have come up because, uh, you know, you, you can never identify in, war some, in predicting war what is going to be the decisive factor because there is not even a decisive factor in absolute terms. All factors make the difference together and most of it, they are relative altogether. That is, uh, even if one was in, uh, maybe all of them were, uh, were, were, let's say, decisive in their own way, because if you took away one from them, uh, you wouldn't make the result, but still you would need all, all, uh, all them together to support even that decisive factor to be decisive, right? So that's real war. So this fact that um, uh, it's all the terrain, right, mm, doesn't sound quite right. And in fact, we have evidence of that, that Phalanx did well in even rough terrain. And then Polybius says, you know, and therefore, however, there are other tactical difficulties and strategical difficulties that derive here from, from this, um, and which are they? So you're kind of shifting the, you know, the, the, the point, uh, the, the, the plan at this point. So um, Polybius says that naturally the Phalanx possesses a single line, uh, uh, differently from the, the legion, the Roman legion that is deployed uh, on the triplex acius, that is, you know, the, the famous three lines of astati, principes, and triari, that allows to use reserves, as, as we've seen, but in these battles it doesn't seem that that had anything to do with how, you know, things went, right? Not even Pitna. Um, and, uh, and still, unless these guys aren't, you know, that they don't have a, a significant numerical advantage. You're basically the, subtracting troops from fighting all at once against the, the main phalanx battle line. So even this doesn't kind of make much sense um, altogether. Yes, reserves are important, no doubt. But is that so important? I mean, that does is that such uh, you know relevant factor that would make the phalanx useless in this? It doesn't seem so. Do we have news here of the phalanx getting exhausted because the Romans could swap lines and they they didn't? There's no evidence of this. On the contrary, we see that the Romans often retreated and were, you know, they wouldn't even come back to fight on that section of the line. And that not all the Roman armies were made up, as we've seen, of the Roman citizen infantry that would fight that way. About the Italian allies didn't always did. I mean, we know they eventually became homogeneous to the rest of citizen infantry, but so also in tactics, but originally, well, that's not said. Maybe, maybe they did something similar, but even in there were not so documented. Um, so, um, the um, Polybius says that this fact of having reserves of the Roman legion uh, allowed the, um, the same reserves to enter certain gaps from which attacking the enemies on the flanks and on the rear. Do we have any evidence of this? We have evidence actually of an entire Roman battle line. We don't know which part, like one of, of the three lines or, or two or all three of them that like at Cunos Cephali had advanced on their front and then they found themselves to have uh, surpassed the, uh, the the Macedonian right on their left, and they turned on it and attacked it. Is that um, merit of reserves? No, that's merit of the fact that there was a battle line that, uh, that the Romans broke, and they, they could now they were free, and they could turn against the uh, the the rear of the other section of the Macedonian line. It was committed against its. Um, it wasn't engaged with, with, with the, uh, the Roman left. Um, where's the importance of the reserve in here? Where's the importance of the reserve when in Pitna the single maniples attacked into the, into the gaps? If the phalanx had not broken, where did the, the Romans outflank uh, the, 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 the phalanx or attack on the rear? There's no evidence of this, right? Um, so, um, the, 
then Polybius also points out the, the fact that the pikeman is a d disadvantage in hand to hand combat, which is which is true. This is fair, absolutely. It, from what we get from the um, the you know the pikeman e equipment, we know that they weren't meant to fight into hand to hand combat. They were equipped actually with good swords sometimes. We think of the Roman gladius could get could actually slash and chop uh, limbs like like crazy, like a a cynoscaphalae was 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 seen, a pitna was seen. Um, but uh, because contrary to what is believed, the gladius is born mostly like a slashing weapon, not as a pointy. But that's just the fact. The, the hyperfunctionalization of the thickest formation in like the first second century A.D. But the gladius is born like a slashing weapon, and it it cut like hell. Right, it was the hair of the Latin um, um, Celtic swords and of the Iberian falcat. Right, the the, the Macedonian pikemen would have things like the copies, for example. Uh, but yes, their equipment wasn't completely fit. We know that over time, especially the Antigonid singly developed a heavier type of that they were he more heavily armored uh, phalanges, right? Uh, which is important because especially the first ranks are exposed to missile, etc. Mm, so yes, we generally say that, and surely the phalanx had to fight frontally with its cohesion, and it was it was so costly that let's put it in this way: it was useless to invest on the hand-to-hand -hand combat capabilities of these units. But first, um, the as we've seen the the. The Hellenistic armies weren't made just of phalanxes, so there were other troops that would fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, there were there were other elite units that were conceived like that, even as commanders and so on. So, yes, uh, the, the Romans had a more homogeneous um, uh, block of aggressive um, spearmen and uh, swordsmen slash swordsmen, by the way, or javeliners. That's so the hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, they, their raison d'être, we, we could say. Um, but at the same time, there were other units, and also, by the way, we, as we've seen, that that capability was somewhat nullified when the, the these troops attacked the phalanx frontally. Also, and interestingly enough, somebody says, "Ah, no, because the Romans shattered the, the softened up the enemy formations with the pila before charging." Well, unfortunately, in all these accounts, there is no mention of that, <laughs> not even once, uh, except at the Battle of Asculum, where it's explicitly said that the Romans threw their pila against the heavy javelins against the elephants, right, and not against the the epirot phalanx. Um, this is relevant also because, contrary to what is commonly believed, heavy javelins were, or javelins in general, were pretty common out there. I mean, if you fight against, I don't know, the Celts or, you know, they, they, they will always have kind of those, like the Barians, the Carthaginian, they would normally use javelins. Yes, the pilum was particular in a way, and it, it was perfection over time, but it, it, it is not the super weapon. The, you know, warfare wasn't significantly changed by that, right? Um, we know that Pyrrhus at some point was, was wounded by a javelin. Uh, I don't think it was a pilum. But, I mean, um, there is, it's even difficult to say, okay, let's distinguish now from certain type of pilum, certain type of javelins, because at the end of the day, the standardization was not there, right? All the, the ancient world, you have Magin an ancient battle is constantly... You know, with the air constantly crossed by javelins stuff, because lots of units had that on a regular base. And in any case, from the sources, we do not see the, the pila doing anything, and even frontally, right? We've just seen that Pol not, Polybius doesn't even take th that into consideration. So no, historically, there's no proof that a pila served dramatically in the size of no. It was probably used, yes, it probably made an effect, but as always, that's not decisive. Most of these battles, th this is a great method of, of looking at things comparatively because it teaches you brutally that here, um, weapons basically, unless they're used collectively like in this massive way such as spikes in the phalanx, are basically useless overall. They, they, they don't even figure in the, in the account of battles. These battles are won by what? By collective group dynamics, like all war is. Fuck weapons. 
weapons are not there. It, 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 it's this fixation coming from war gamers that have to say, ah, if I equip my soldier with that, I can't defeat. No, it does. War, real war doesn't work like that. Real war doesn't care what you have in your hands when you want to rip someone's guts off. That's what makes the difference. Your moral force. The rest all comes second. It's not that weapons were not important. They were. Right? And they probably played an important role in this regard. With when when a Roman a legionnaire would, would cut to pieces those those um uh, Macedonian pikemen. Hell how they would. Or Randus wounds. The ancient warfare is, is low butchery. Right, it's something like a, an inerrable bath of blood. Uh, but at the same time, as we've seen, that was triggered by major misfunctionings of large units because of command problems, because of deployment problems, because of the absence of a chain of command. This has nothing to do with the invincibility of the phalanx. They, they surely, from, from the front, they surely had found a good formula there, but still, it was, enu it was not enough. So in this regard, Polybius is right in pointing out the fact that a, uh, you know, in the accidents of war, uh, the, the, this very well calibrated system of the phalanx was probably more fragile than the Roman system. But, it doesn't seem that they had a decisive edge. After all, the Romans were defeated by this multiple times, as we've seen in this list. And they also defeated them back. But still for reasons that appear a bit unrelated to the, well, again, to, to the formation mechanics there. Um, Polybius makes also one of the most beautiful remarks in, uh, in ancient history about the fact that that the, leg the Roman legionnaire can intervene everywhere, in formation and not, being trained for every kind of combat. This is absolutely true. The versatility of a Roman legionnaire was dramatic, but here we're talking about, from an individual point of view, that, as we've seen, is basically relevant in these battle uh, accounts. So, Polybius... Uh, account is we all thank uh, the divine or for him that we have this this account but this account is very educational because it shows you how not just because you talk about something you're competent about it or you understand it which are very different things uh, unfortunately we would all like that Poly polybius to be perfect but it's not so right and be aware because the human mind is dramatically in tune with Polybian modern and positivistic thinking. We learned to think rationally thanks to these people, to the Greeks. So we are used to reason like that. But it doesn't mean that it is true because this is theory if you want even abstraction. And that's the same reason in part why possibly in a broader cultural sense the Greeks you know, at the end of the day here got conquered by the Romans. And that does make a difference because Rome, arguably, was also a bit more impacting than than the Greeks, in especially as far as the political, the social, the military aspect is concerned. And we are also used to, maybe not to reason, but to feel a bit as Romans, with their warlike background, with their, you know, very speedy, uh, elevation from a barbaric state into a civilization. Um, so we have to listen to both these chords of our heart when we read this stuff. Because we cannot explain why Rome conquered the world um, simply by saying, you know, it's that simple. They invented a better tactical system. It's not that. It's not even the military. It's what stood behind that. It's political and social. As always, this is a Clausewitzian thinking. The rest doesn't work. Um, and I believe this compare. I was happy to, to have made this video because I, I don't know how easy, uh, you know, how, how well it turned out. Because it, these are important topics, as you understand. They, they do teach you to 
to reason through stuff and uh, this will be even clearer when we will have made all those battle videos on these topics because um, um, it's very easy in anything to search for the easy explanation the simple the, the one that not even the simple one because as you understand the answer here is relatively simple the answer is so simple that it's almost embarrassing <laughs> these military systems were dramatically similar and there were some factors that are explicitated in here that made the difference that have basically a very few if nothing actually to do with the intrinsic advantage of these um, or disadvantage respectively of these tactical models because guess what war is always like this um, it's it's funny even how when we and, and that's where we spot how modernistic and positivistic minded we are because fundamentally we are more prone to believe and that tells you also how dramatically mil military um, uneducated we are and historically uneducated we are for us it's much easier to understand the homogeneity of a contemporary military system to another which is actually much more different in absolute terms than an ancient one <laughs> it was dramatically uh, more symmetric and we have to search for this mechanic difference that made the difference uh, there quite wasn't <laughs> and, and the difference in war is, all, is made mostly by moral forces by, by accidents luck, you can't, military history teaches you dramatically well that you can be the greatest commander in the world but if you're not lucky you, you can't do much there is not a predictable way in war more than in, 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 in war less than in ever in every other um, human activity and therefore you have to be open to the idea that certain things are even better left unanswered right because I as it, I said at the beginning of the video I can't even think that objectively the, the Roman legion was superior to it but the reason why I think it was superior is because I see what stood behind it and not much because of what it, it did on the field and I'm prone to believe actually that yes the Macedonian phalanx was actually a, a more complete a more advanced tactical system it, it, when functioning correctly uh, ideally it was superior but is reality ideal no right and this answer is very some people would they would say mainstream because at the end of the day that that's what people mostly say but with all the love and passion I have for the Romans you can't go out there and claim that uh, after having observed these battles that the Roman model was so dramatically superior that they won because you know that the, they crushed the the, the, the the phalanx because it wasn't you know they, they exploited the gaps it was superior that it wasn't like that most of the times the Romans won because they were lucky but they had had the guts to stand their ground in front of that system that everybody was frightened by because they had the moral and material resources to afford that and that's what freaking made the difference because if you don't dare you will never succeed and that's what the Romans did and what the Romans were dramatically aware of and reality is not ideal reality is not abstract and if you really want something in life you have to go out there and take your risk because otherwise you will you will just wait and see the next conqueror that does it for you that's why it's important to study military history and to understand how important and, respons and responsabilizing and empowering and morally necessary it is to understand these things because through these you can make the world better you you have the intelligence of a civilization from your side and war is always a, a testing ground for a civilization chiefly from from a moral uh, then political most point of view then the military is just an instrument as we know from von Clausewitz and naturally uh, jumping from a merely tactical analysis to these conclusions is a bit astonishing because uh, the, there is lots of things in the middle that we will have to talk about the, regarding the Roman army and so on so 
just know that I have my playlist on Ancient Warfare, where usually I like to digress in these topics, so um, probably if you listen to here and there, you will you will get what's my, my line of thinking there. Uh, but these are also th concepts that are at this point are historiographically pretty well established. Like, I can't make disclosure about them, but I'm not an expert, I just, you know, I'm an amateur regarding to this specific topic, because, as you know, I'm, I'm a medievalist. But, um, in terms of military history, it, 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 it does make sense. I mean, if you, if you don't get these points, uh, it, 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 it means you don't get even the rest of military history. And that's why it's so easy to spot when you have studied the sources and a person has it. Because you know what that's about. And, and that the other hasn't passed through that and therefore hasn't made up his mind like that. And and that goes for equally for maybe it's I'm sure it's plenty of people out there of my age, even older, that maybe know nothing about military history, uh or history of warfare in general, but are so obsessed and keen and uh opinionated on this specific topic because they have debated about and on Facebook and on groups on pages they have seen it on video games they have tried to replicate it and uh, war games they they're, they know all about that but then maybe they don't know anything else right and always remember you you can't understand the second punic war if you don't you know if you don't study the thir the 30 years war uh, you can't understand the 100 years war if you don't study the first world war uh, that's the beauty of military history Right. If you want to make a favor to yourself, and I say it also because we mentioned Polybius so much, if you have really just to study one campaign, one, for your life, but I mean in a serious way, like historians do, that you pick all the sources and you study it for a, a year straight as a serious person, pick the Second Punic War. Because that's truly the most complete, uh, didactically wise, of all military history. Like wh what happened there is not not just has changed also consistently the art of war, but... Uh, is practically um, it practically expands on every scenario, on every aspect, of tactical, strategical, political, and it, it really opens your mind dramatically. And we will talk about it. Uh, I realize I think we never made yeah maybe a couple of videos on the Second Punic War, but very you know, about certain details and not others. So I today I expressly avoided to. Even if I inserted a picture of uh, Scipio Africanus to, you know, to talk about the development of the Roman army in in between, especially during the Second Punic War, so across this uh, time span we have observed today, because that is crucial to understand a lot about the Roman legion, the Manipular legion, and um, there are lots of aspects that come into my mind, especially when you know you study, I don't know, the Battle of Pitna is relatively late, and you. You think it, of what was happening also in the second century BC, a Roman army. Everybody is, seems to be very dogmatic, very, very inflexible about the fact that before there was just a Manipura legion, then eventually from Marius on the Cortal legion. No. Um, there was a great mm, mm, period of transition in between that we can't even see clearly, and also don't even think it was, was what was achieved in, f in the full maturity of the Manipula religion by the end of the third century BC was actually replicated, I don't know, at the times of Pitna or so. It's very complex, and we, we largely don't know, and there is still, frankly, to write uh, a serious work about the, actually, the genesis of the Cortal Legion. Uh, we know, at this point, the, the Manipur Legion, I, we, we know it relatively well. I, I must say, I've had my share of years spent on these things, but from a purely private point of, personal point of view, um, but the Cortal Legion, nobody actually gave yet um, an answer because it's uh, objectively we we don't have enough information. But still, there is something more to be said here and there, which is not definitive because, as I was saying before, like all what we have here is is what we have. It's already been studied completely. There is no mis mystery, no exoteric knowledge to draw from it. But here and there, some shades, some interpretations can still you know make uh, a point just for today's topic just know that it's it's exhausted and that what we have for the in 
told for from the sources of those battles is basically all we have about that. Uh, of course, a bit of archaeological knowledge, knowing, for example, today we didn't, uh, we could conclude on other aspects such as, uh, such as a, a conclusion. Uh, the the clash between the phalanx and the legion seems to have been often resolved by factors that were uh, external to the nature of the same tactical systems. Right, the normal battle conditions didn't contemplate, as we have seen, possibility of um, outflanking from the side of the maniples. There was no space if the enemy formation didn't battle line didn't break. They couldn't go through. They they wouldn't outflank. That there was no. It's not shown. These are, by the way, these are some of the most important battles were fought out there. Right, for the ancient world, ancient historiography tells us about these major clashes because the objectively most important ones. And of course, there were lots of hundreds, thousands of clashes that we can start studying only from medieval times onwards because there is enough level of documentation and here are completely lost and forgotten. Right, um, so there would be an enormous amount of of reality to 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 to, to look at. We we know a very few. It's so few here, it's almost depressing, right? And you know that there was much more. Um, so what we see here, though, it's in, in, it's in outline. And the fact that such information is so essential does help in practice because a synthesis capability in, in warfare is, is, is very important. Military history is very important. That such outflanking maneuvers were was entrusted by lighter, more mobile troops, such as cavalry, skirmishers, elephants, that as we've seen here, made a, a difference. Um, that these were units that operated synergically with infantry according to tactics of combined arms. I remember recently, what was it? was a guy who was complaining about the fact what the synergy means. It's one of those names that people use that they do not even know what it means in military. Synergy is simply the Greek equivalent of cooperation in Latin. I mean, literally, synergy means cooperation. If you don't know what synergy means, I mean, I remember this guy had was making this video with a, with a background full of books. Like, you know, you've read all those books, you don't know what synergy means, you're an illiterate. Okay? You know, it, it, that's just, you, you have never opened it. Uh, but anyhow, th I know it's hard to, sometimes you like to be polemical, because because if you're not polemical, you don't dare, you, you can't learn. Right. We, we have to be courageous about our actions. I studied these things because I care about them. So I can't come here and say this stuff. Um, that, that's where it, my... If, if, you don't, if you just wonder and, and you don't go check yourself, you can't say anything. And so I, I urge you, I advise you to, to do the same. Study these battles. It, there, there are a few sources after all. Uh, if you don't know Latin and Greek, yes, it's a bit of a problem, but um, you can learn, right? Even just, if you have a translation, you can, today, you can use even a dictionary. You say, yeah, okay, you, you won't understand maybe the declensions on this stuff. It's a problem, yes. <laughs> but um, still, even that exercise can acquaint you with how uh, you can't even properly translate a language. Like, I don't need to quote Wittgenstein, but you know, every every language is a different thing. There is not an equivalent of another language uh, in translation. But getting to the conclusion, once again, confusion among the lines, tactical errors, um, outflanking from these lighter troops, not from infantry, and the simple chance, luck, if you want, or un of unlock, seem to have been the determinant uh, causes of the battle outcomes, right? We we have to take into account Polybius' opinion that objectively states that something that that it may be true that the the, the phalanx was, I mean, a more complex and be more fragile in a sense, but more sophisticated system than the legion that required also greater ability and capacity of command compared maybe to the legion to be at least employed at its best. So this is this is a disadvantage indeed because surely a civilization that is able to create a, the, the phalanx is, is a great one but still it does require very high standards. Uh, the Romans in, in that regard also as marketing teaches might have had 
you know, the good enough, which in war is basically what dominates, you know, you know, in doctrine, you know, you don't need the best, you don't need what works, right? And that's something that the Greeks probably had difficulties to understand, culturally speaking, because they never gave up the idea that there could be something more advanced than it, their own. They had to find some, you know, random contingental element to to motivate it. But yes, the, even in here, there is a pattern. That is, at the end of the day, the Romans made it, right? So uh, that cannot be ignored. You see, it, it is chance, as we said before. But at the same time, it, it repeats itself over a certain amount of time. It was enough to make the Romans win these wars. And that can't be ignored. Um, so the ground in which I we would I would like to shift eventually the topic because I also got interested in it is that the complex of resources um, talking about training um, troops trainings and generals experience expertise probably rendered the phalanx also a more costly more expensive instrument right uh, and in turn it does mean that yes in conditions of full efficiency there are you know however closer to theory than to practice, the phalanx could actually represent a superior tactical system. It's just that, in theory, in practice, things went otherwise. And it can't be just all bad luck, it's a sum of factors that are all, if you want, equally important in, in their relative value. We can't measure them at, given this level of documentation at this distance in time. But they probably do speak, and that's why I think that the Roman legion, at the end of the day, was was superior. And I, I hate to hate to be, you know, to side from the opinion of the majority. But belie uh, believe me, I did believe at a point that the, the phalanx was somewhat superior. But I did realize that the ideal is not real, and we would all like to speculate how to solve things theoretically, but. Military history, especially in von Clausewitz, teach us that without practice you go nowhere. That you can speculate all the time, but the best positive uh, lesson you can take from war in order to wage it, to fight, to command, is from practice and from military history itself as an accompaniment. And this military history we made today shows us that at the end of the day, the Roman legion gained what was enough to make it. And that is something you cannot ignore in a military uh, historical analysis. It's too important. It's, in a way, the answer that you will never find explicitated in the sources. But it's there. It's In this sense, it's, it's somewhat fragile. It's somewhat small. It's a small edge, but it was enough. Hmm? And that's how I like to to address this topic. So naturally, we'll t I know that there will be plenty of recriminations, everybody has its own opinion. Yeah, I know, this is my one. And I came to it after years. And um, so it probably I, I've thought about it enough to, you know, for some random person learning all that the, 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 the day before and, you know, complaining about it. But so you should at least take that into consideration. I never wanted to convince anyone so everybody has to learn by oneself. So I, I can't give an advice, like a, a key uh, of interpretation, but I can't force you, my opinion down to your throat. So um, it, this is just something I personally came up with. And I do this for a living. I like it. And uh, that's my take on it. Right. Um, we will talk again about this uh, often because we have to cover over all this period, most of these um, states, armies, organizations, of Roman history, the, the Hellenistic kingdoms, etc. So, we, all the battles, so we have to look in detail at all these things. Um, this was just the essentials. Mm -hmm. So for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming 
content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.